It's time for the three question warm up for farm six. Let's get going. What artery is damaged via hemorrhagic stroke or ischemic stroke with each of the following presentations? So first one we have here is aneurysm causes the eye to look down and out. So this is a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. Aneurysm may cause bilateral loss of lateral visual fields. So this is the anterior communicating artery aneurysm compressing the optic chiasm. Broca or Wernicke aphasia, this is the middle cerebral artery stroke. Unilateral lower extremity sensory and or motor loss, this is the anterior cerebral artery stroke. Unilateral facial and arm sensory and or motor loss, this is going to be the middle cerebral artery stroke again. Next question. Which diuretic is used in the treatment of pseudotumor cerebri? So this is going to be acetazolamide, and we don't use it much for diuresis, but we do use it for the pseudotumor cerebri problem uh, and glaucoma, and sometimes with altitude sickness. Next question. When does in, uh, implantation of the zygote take place? That's going to be six days after fertilization. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. In this video, we're going to continue talking about how cells communicate with one another through neurotransmitters and other chemicals that interact with different types of receptors. And our main focus is going to be on G protein receptors and the second messengers that they use. So it's tempting for a lot of students to sort of shove this off and forget about it, say this isn't clinically relevant. It's fairly true, but for your test, this is a four-star topic. You should definitely expect to see this on your test. And really, it's not all that bad. There are a couple of really good mnemonics that make it pretty easy to learn. So pay attention. Once a neurotransmitter, like acetylcholine, binds to a postsynaptic receptor, that receptor has to do something to send a signal downstream into the cell so that something happens, right? Now, one type of downstream signaling mechanism that the body uses is called a G-protein second messenger. Now, back in foundations, we talked about tyrosine kinase receptors found on the plasma membrane. Well, this is another type of receptor on the plasma membrane. This G protein receptor has a protein that passes through the plasma membrane seven times. It's usually depicted like a big bundle of sticks, or to me it kind of looks like a big bundle of dynamite. But sometimes it's referred to as a seven-pass transmembrane receptor. It's also known as a G protein linked receptor because it's associated with this blue G protein, and it activates the G protein to do something. So let's start out by reviewing some different classes of receptors and, and what downstream effects they have. So we're going to start with the cholinergic receptors. Remember, there are two different flavors of cholinergic receptors. There's nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. Now, nicotinic receptors are those ligand-gated ion channels. Nicotine binds and the channel opens up and that lets cations like sodium and potassium through. So nicotinic receptors don't use G proteins. But the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are G protein linked receptors. So let's talk about muscarinic receptors for a minute. All muscarinic receptors are not created equal. There are several subclasses or subtypes of muscarinic receptors, which are M1, M2, and M3. And actually, there's also M4 and M5. We're just going to focus on M1, M2, and M3. The M1 muscarinic receptors are found in the enteric nervous system. And again, this is the parasympathetic nervous system, so this is rest and digest. So it makes sense, you need muscarinic receptors in the gut. The M2 receptors are going to decrease contractility and heart rate in the atria and at the SA node. And then the M3 receptors are going to increase bladder contraction and increase gut peristalsis. And they're also going to start making things leaky, right? M3, M3 receptors uh, in the tear glands cause lacrimation or tearing. And they also cause meiosis and they cause bronchoconstriction. Now, we've seen all these parasympathetic effects before. You just need to recognize that there are different classes of muscarinic receptors in the different target tissues. Then, for the adrenergic receptors, you're already familiar with the subtypes of adrenergic receptors, right? Alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2. Let's start with the alpha receptors. Alpha-1 receptors cause vascular smooth muscle contraction. So alpha-1 receptors cause vasoconstriction. That's why epinephrine or norepinephrine is going to raise the blood pressure because they're stimulating those alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. So think alpha-1 vasoconstriction. Alpha-2 receptors are the presynaptic autoreceptors, and they inhibit norepinephrine release. So alpha-2 stimulation inhibits sympathetic outflow. That's going to inhibit some of that alpha-1 mediated vasoconstriction. That's the main action. But in fairness, just to confuse things a little bit, alpha-2 receptors are also found on certain blood vessels. And they, there they do cause a little bit of vasoconstriction. Beta-1 receptors increase heart rate and they increase myocardial contractility. 
That's why adrenaline makes your heart pound in your chest. And beta-2 receptors cause vasodilation and also some bronchodilation. So for beta-1, I want you to think about increased heart rate and increased contractility. For beta-2, I want you to think about vasodilation and bronchodilation. So all of those receptors, the muscarinic receptors and all those adrenergic receptors, they're all G-protein receptors. Every one of those is a seven-pass transmembrane receptor that activates a G-protein to do something. But G-proteins aren't just found in the autonomic nervous system. There are also plenty of other receptors that use G-proteins too, so let's go over some of those. There are dopamine receptors. So dopamine is another catecholamine, like we said earlier, but it isn't part of the autonomic nervous system. It's mainly a neurotransmitter in the brain. So D1 dopamine receptors are going to relax renal vascular smooth muscles, and D2 dopamine receptors are primarily found in the brain. Histamine receptors also use G proteins. So H1 histamine receptors are responsible for allergy symptoms, like nasal secretion, bronchial mucus production. They're also going to cause some pruritus or itching, and they're also going to cause a bronchoconstriction. So that's why if a patient's having an allergic reaction, we can give an antihistamine to help relieve some of those allergic symptoms. And then H2 histamine receptors increase gastric acid secretion. So if you want to inhibit allergy symptoms, you're going to give an antihistamine to inhibit the H1 receptors. But if you want to inhibit gastric acid production, you might give an H2 blocker like cimetidine or ranitidine. Then one more group of receptors that are linked to G proteins are the vasopressin receptors. Now, what's the other name for vasopressin? It's ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. There are two different subtypes of vasopressin receptors. V1 vasopressin receptors increase vascular smooth muscle contraction, cause some vasoconstriction. So sometimes vasopressin is given during codes to cause some vasoconstriction. And then the V2 vasopressin receptors are going to increase reabsorption in the collecting tubules of the kidney. And so that's how ADH works, by stimulating those V2 receptors in the kidneys. And remember that when we talk about the actions of a hormone or of a neurotransmitter, it's actually the receptor that determines the physiologic effects that you're going to see. But altogether, that makes 13 different receptor classes that you need to recognize as working by way of a G-protein mechanism. So there's M1, M2, and M3 muscarinic receptors. Remember, those respond to acetylcholine. There's alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2 adrenergic receptors, and those respond to epinephrine and norepinephrine. D1 and D2 dopamine receptors, H1 and H2 histamine receptors, and V1 and V2 vasopressin receptors. Now let's drill down and talk about how these G protein receptors work. Each of these specific hormones or neurotransmitters is activating a specific type of receptor, and each receptor is in turn utilizing a specific type of G protein. And G proteins come in three distinct flavors, GQ, GI, and GS. So what does a GQ protein do? A GQ protein, once it's activated by its specific neurotransmitter, is going to activate an enzyme called phospholipase C. So take norepinephrine as an example. Norepinephrine activates an alpha-1 receptor, and that alpha-1 GQ protein is going to then activate phospholipase C. Phospholipase C is going to act on a chemical called phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. And that's a mouthful, so we abbreviate it PIP2, phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. So phospholipase C cleaves PIP2 into two chemicals, IP3 and DAG, and both of these have downstream effects. IP3 is inositol triphosphate, and inositol triphosphate increases intracellular calcium. Again, calcium is very important. That increase in intracellular calcium can then mediate any number of different effects. And then the other chemical here, when PIP2 is cleaved, it also produces DAG, which is diacylglycerol. And that diacylglycerol has the downstream effect of activating an enzyme called protein kinase C. So the downstream effect of activating phospholipase C is the activation of protein kinase C. So that's pretty easy to remember, associate those C's together. And then also C for calcium. So I want you to remember that GQ activates C, Q and C. And there's a great mnemonic, cute C's have one M and M. Cute C's is like a cute little kid, a cutesy, but it's also Q and C. So cute C's have one M and M. And have one M and M tells you which receptors utilize this GQ protein. So there's H1, alpha-1, and V1 the histamine 1 receptor, the alpha 1 receptor, and the vasopressin 1 receptor. That's the have 1 part of the mnemonic. And then the M and M is for M1 and M3. So remember, cutesies have one M and M, and remember all the C's in that GQ pathway, phospholipase C, protein kinase C, and calcium. And you've got it.
Now, it's almost totally clinically irrelevant, but you will be tested on it, so you need to know it. The next G protein, remember we said there are three different types of G proteins. The next G protein is a GS. This one's pretty easy. S is for stimulates. So what's it stimulating? Well, it's stimulating adenylocyclase. And adenylocyclase, what does it do? Well, it converts ATP to cyclic AMP. And then cyclic AMP is a modulator that has a downstream effect of activating protein kinase A. So GS stimulates adenylocyclase to convert ATP to cyclic AMP, which activates protein kinase A. And then GI is the third type of G protein, and I is for inhibit. So GI inhibits adenylocyclase. So you have less production of cyclic AMP and less activation of protein kinase A. So of all of those receptors, D1 and D2 and beta 1 and alpha 2, out of all of those, which ones use GS and which ones use GI? Well, the mnemonic for the GI link receptors is the MAD2s. I think of inhibit and MAD as being negative words, so they kind of go together. So GI is the MAD2s. M in MAD is for M2, A is for alpha 2, and D is for the dopamine D2 receptors, so the MAD2s. So if you can remember those two mnemonics, QTs have one M and M for GQ, and then the MAD2s for GI, then you can just know that the GS protein is the default, and all the other G protein receptors we listed are going to use the GS mechanism. So that includes beta 1, beta 2, D1, H2, and V2. Now let's take a look at number four in your study guide. At the top of number four, there's this complex pathway that summarizes a lot of this in a little bit different way. And then underneath that, we've replaced the different steps with numbers so that you can quiz yourself. Now, I'm not going to go over all of this again, but let's hit a few of the high points. Over here on the left, the hormone or transmitter binds to that 7-pass transmembrane receptor, which is linked to a G protein. And then following it down, you have activation of the alpha subunit of the G protein, which then activates adenylylcyclase, cyclic AMP, and protein kinase A. So which G protein does that? That's GS, S for stimulate, right? And then down in the middle, this would be a different receptor because it's a different second messenger pathway. Here, the activation of the G protein activates phospholipase C and IP3 and increased calcium, and then DAG and activation of protein kinase C. So which G protein would do that? That would be GQ. Now, the other way to get to this phospholipase C pathway is with a tyrosine kinase receptor. You start with a growth factor binding to a tyrosine kinase receptor. So what kind of transmitter uses a tyrosine kinase receptor? Well, none of the things we've been talking about. Dopamine and acetylcholine and all these other transmitters use G protein length receptors. For tyrosine kinase receptors, we're mostly talking about things like insulin and prolactin and also several growth factors, such as insulin-like growth factor, uh, fibroblast growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, growth hormone. Those all use tyrosine kinase receptors. And there are two different pathways the uh, tyrosine kinase receptor can use. One pathway is similar to the GQ pathway in that it activates phospholipase C. But the other pathway, the more well-known tyrosine kinase pathway, is the RAS activating pathway. You have an adapter protein that activates the RAS activating system, and then that activates protein kinase 1, 2, and 3. And then that has a downstream effect. So these pathways are important to understand. Again, it's about a four-star topic. So I want you to make sure you know the difference between GQ and GS and GI. Make sure you know what each of those different G protein linked receptors does. And then make sure you know what these pathways look like, be able to draw out these pathways in your mind. All right, before we get to the end of session quiz, let's do another whiteboard review. In this whiteboard review, we're going to match the three different classes of G proteins to their actions. So we have GI, GQ, and GS. So let's start out with GI. Remember we said GI, the I stands for inhibit. So GI starts out by inhibiting adenylocyclase, and that leads to decreased cyclic AMP, and that leads to less activation of protein kinase A. Then for GQ, GQ is the handsome protein. You can remember uh, Q and C. So we start out GQ activates phospholipase C, and that phospholipase C is going to cleave PIP2 to IP3 and DAG. And so, so here we have two actions. Uh, the IP3 is going to increase calcium. So we'll draw a little arrow there. And then the DAG is going to activate protein kinase C. And then for GS, 
Remember, GS, S is for stimulate, so GS stimulates adenyl cyclase, and that's going to increase cyclic AMP, and that will activate protein kinase A. Now let's also practice uh, listing the transmitters that go with each of these. Uh, so GI, remember the mnemonic is the MAD2. So for GI we have M2, alpha 2, and D2. Then for GQ, that's QTs have one M and M. So that's H1, alpha 1, V1, and then M1, and M3. And why is it M3? Well, you know it's M3 and not M2, because M2 goes with the MAD2s. And then GS is all the leftover receptors. So you really need both of these mnemonics. So for GS, you have beta 1, beta 2, H2, V2, and D1. All right, good job on this one. So for that, you get 10 gold stars. So now it's time for the end of session quiz. So go ahead and work through the quiz, and then we'll go over the answers together. All right, this is a short quiz, but again, it's very, very high yield. First question, what G protein class does each of the following receptors stimulate? So alpha 1 is GQ, alpha 2 is GI, beta 1 is GS, and beta 2 is also GS, M1 is GQ, M2 is GI, M3 is GQ, and then D2 is GI. And the last question, outline the pathway by which stimulation of a GS receptor activates protein kinase A. So the GS receptor activates adenyl cyclase, and then adenyl cyclase turns ATP into cyclic AMP, and then cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. Now, we're going to quiz you on all these G protein pathways again and again in these warm-up quizzes, so make sure you know them. But for right now, that's it for Farm Basics 6, so I'll see you next time. Students, today's topic is autonomic neurotransmission, and I have my super duper magic med board to help. Which type of G protein activates phospholipase C? It's GQ, the handsome protein. <laughs> Remember, QC, GQ, and phospholipase C. C for phospholipase C, C for calcium, and C for protein kinase C. And what receptors are linked to GQ proteins? Remember, QTs have one M&M. &M. H for histamine 1, A for alpha 1, V for vasopressin 1, and M&M &M for M1 and M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. I'm cute, Uncle Albert. Can I have one M&M? &M? Oh, sorry, honey. I don't actually have any M&Ms. What? This is a load of bull. You don't dangle M&Ms in front of a kid. Jeez. Cutesy? I guess in her case, C is for crabby. Ha ha ha.